Chuck, it's great to see you today. Hey, Jason. Chuck, you were a squadron leader in SEAL Team 6, and you've been following the war in Ukraine very closely for the whole two and a half years at this point. But yesterday, there was something sort of exciting that happened. It seems that the Russians had the intention of making a major advance in Kurkivka, and it doesn't seem that it worked out exactly the way that the Russians had hoped. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? Yeah, uh, not a good day uh, for the Russians. And at the beginning, it looked like perhaps it wasn't going to be a very good day for the Ukrainians. I, I, as you know, I follow the war pretty closely, uh, three or four uh, contact maps a day. Uh, this this took place in Kherkivka, which is uh, on the western limits uh, of Donetsk uh, at the front line. Uh, the Ukrainian 79th Brigade uh, sees movement in front of them. Uh, and it, it is a very large-scale Russian operation, approximately 57 armored vehicles. Uh, they carried 200 infantry at least. Uh, this attack was preceded by a phalanx of, of 12 motorcycles. Uh, 79th Brigade was not caught napping. But this, uh, as far as I can tell, may have been the largest uh, Russian offensive operation certainly in the last six months and and quite possibly longer than that an interesting development uh contact occurred uh like i said the 79th brigade was not caught napping they destroyed six russian tanks and seven apcs uh, which are the infantry fighting vehicles in the initial contact most of the motorcycles were destroyed now this amount of damage a russian force of 57 vehicles Losing six tanks and seven APCs, that that still leaves you, you know, the high end of 40 vehicles still in operation. But this initial contact broke the back of the Russian assault, and they turned around and started running. Uh, the dismounted infantry jumped off. They were running on foot, and the attack was broken up. And uh, 79th Brigade continued the, the attack with first-person FPV drones and uh, drone-directed artillery. It absolutely broke the back of this Russian attack. And what's interesting to me, Jason, is, you know, I've been talking a lot about the lower combat effectiveness of these Russian forces. Point of attacks, for example, in Kremena, Russian attacks all often outnumber Ukrainian defenders 10 to 1, but they don't seem to gain any ground. Previously, Russian, you know, the uh, modus operandi of the Russians is feeding one platoon at a time into contact, very small scale. Diminished combat effectiveness, we have suspected. Problems with morale, uh, definitely, we, we see the signs of this, but this the failure of this attack with adequate vehicles uh, it just shows that morale and combat effectiveness for Russian units, it's abysmal. This was a defeat. And here's the other thing I noticed. Russia put together this huge attack and they carried it out in broad daylight. Not at night where they might have a chance, but in broad daylight. This was a big defeat. And uh, we watched it happen live. There's there's numerous posts on the, on the the on Twitter about it and you can see for yourself. So put this into perspective for us. If this was, let's imagine, the U.S. military, and you suffered that sort of a defeat, what sort of consequences would it have for the leadership of that unit? Well, here's the thing. In any NATO unit, the initial casualties, you know, four or five tanks and, and several APCs, that was sustainable damage. That was, that was the kind of damage that you could expect on contact. Um, you know, I often say this, the easiest thing in the world to do in the military is to attack. You know the enemy's over there and you head at him. The hardest thing in the in military operations to do is when your attack goes badly, when you get a bloody nose, then you have to press forward. Then all the people need to work together. Uh, units that are in trouble need to be reinforced. Maneuver elements have to go around enemy strong points. These are, you know, but this isn't great tactics. This is just 
fundamental basics of, of ground maneuver warfare. So the magic number here is, let's say this was a United States cavalry unit, which would, you know, in modern day cavalry, they have infantry fighting vehicles and main battle tanks, and they have, you know, they have uh, the equivalent of motor rifle troops. When this attack faltered, broke, turned around and retreated, you know, 40, 40 or more vehicles got away. I mean, by the time you got back to your Western military base, you, you were a colonel in charge of this, you'd be out of a job. You'd be relieved on the spot and you'd probably be court-martialed for dereliction of duty. The takeaway from this is Russian forces have no cohesiveness. And this, this may have been the reason why one platoon at a time is fed into the battle because they cannot operate in a multilateral environment. They cannot tactically integrate uh, uh, troops. They're badly commanded, they're badly trained, they're badly led, and their morale is bad. Not a good thing. So I've read that since the start of the war, Russia has lost about 87% of the soldiers that they initially had when the invasion began. And so now, do we see evidence that the new people that are being sent into battle are less experienced or less trained than the ones that Russia was initially using? Yeah, you know, and I think it may even be higher that the estimate, and I originally didn't know whether to believe this or not, but it's, it's the UK Ministry of Defense Intelligence putting out this number. They estimate that Russia started the initial invasion with somewhere between 400 and 500,000 troops. Heretofore, in, in, the, in the conflict, Russia has lost somewhere north of 400,000 casualties. So in broad terms, that means the equivalent of everyone who invaded two years ago is now dead. Okay. And again, this is, U this is the UK defense intelligence. In the months of June uh, and, and July, Russia lost 70,000 dead. So in the last two months, almost twice as many as the U.S. lost in Vietnam in 10 years. And you, when you point to, are these replaced, are the people who are now in Ukraine, are they not as trained as the other ones? Yeah, I'd say we know that a, a Russian soldier who goes from getting grabbed on the Moscow subway, his training period, there isn't one. He gets put on a bus, and three weeks later, he's in Ukraine. So he's not trained. Now, here's the interesting part to me. If you, And we also know that Russian soldiers are not rotated out of Ukraine. So let's say you were one of the original soldiers who came into Ukraine and somehow miraculously you have survived. You are not a backbone of your unit. You're, you're not a cagey old veteran. You're not gonna assume leadership like Sergeant Rock. Your attitude is bad. You are a lag. You, you, know, you know how to do just the minimum. So you're not a you're not the backbone. You are a bacillus of defeat that is spread in these units. You have guys with no training, and we know the relationship between non-commissioned officers and draftees in the Russian military, as it was in the Soviet military, and as it was in the imperial military. You show up with your new sea bag, they take all your gear, they beat you up, they steal your cookies from home. And you get all the bad duty, and they get your gear. So again, those are, those are things, Jason, that that tear an armed force apart from the inside. I mean, morale is not everything in a unit, but man, it is it, it is a it is a tentpole of your military effectiveness is your morale. So we've seen the Russian soldiers die off. Do we also see that Russia has less military equipment than it had before? Has it changed what it's using? Is it using older equipment? What do we see on that front? Yeah, there's, uh, you know, we much is made of the T-54 tanks that are being sent to the front. And I, I don't put too much on that, except I will say this. T-54, like 1954, like before Elvis had a, had a hit. Okay, that's the kind of stuff that should be parked in, in a veterans park somewhere. I mean, that, that's not modern battle equipment. But a, another major 
component is T-62 tanks. I mean, T-62 like President Kennedy, 1962. And even their more modern, air quotes, T-72s like Disco. So these, these are not uh, relevant main battle tanks. The metallurgy is bad. They don't have sensors. Their optics are bad. Uh, and we find Russia is not using them as main battle tanks. Even in this recent attack, uh, these vehicles are now being used as self-propelled guns. And they're really not. I mean, it's a fine distinction for a civilian, but a, a propelled artillery piece has a different kind of gun than a tank. And basically, an artillery gun shoots up in the air and the shell comes down. A, a tank shoots like a rifle. Uh, so they don't do the same jobs. There's another problem with uh, Russia's use of their armored personnel vehicles, infantry fighting vehicles. To call them armored is a mistake. A 50 caliber bullet, which is a which is a, a, a round that is shot from a machine gun, Western machine gun, will go through front and back of that armored vehicle. Some types of infantry rifles will go right through it. And they're very cramped inside. What I'm saying is they invented this, this contraption, uh, but it's very badly done. It can carry troops, but I've been in them. You have to you know, curl yourself into a little ball. So their infantry soldiers ride on the outside of them where they're completely vulnerable. But riding on the outside of that, where bullets can get you, is preferable to burning to death when it's hit. So the tools are bad, the training is bad, the leadership is bad, and we're starting to see, you know, we're starting to see the symptom of this large attack that failed. Look, it doesn't bode well for the future of Russian combat. When you look at what the Russian military is trying to do now, what is their plan? I mean, we had the big attack yesterday. But looking forward, is there a strategy? What do you see them intending to do? You know, I, I say this a lot, and uh, I, 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 I say it at the risk of being contradicted. You know, I was always taught, don't underestimate your enemy, but take a long, hard look at their capabilities. In my opinion, and I may be wrong, I'll come on to eat crow if I am, there is no Russian plan to win the war. They, they don't have one. There is no big summer offensive coming with multiple brigade task groups converging on, on Ukrainian cities, enveloping them, besieging them, and moving on. They don't have a plan. Part of the reason they don't have a plan is the tool. What the Russian army is, is no longer capable of, in my opinion, of conducting these kinds of operations. They can't conduct big operations anymore. They don't have trained soldiers to do it. They have a generation of officers who've come up under Putin, and these guys are military buffoons. You know, they they are not they are not the the trained officer corps of of warrior scholars that are produced in the West. You know, it's sort of uh, maybe it's lost on a lot of the Western population. By the time you are a, a lieutenant commander or a major in in the Western Armed Forces, you expect to have a master's degree and you've gone to command and staff college. If you want to be an admiral or a general, you have a PhD. That's who gets selected for those ranks. It isn't like that in the Russian armed forces. If you're a general, it's because you're in on the grift, right? You, you know, you're making money, you're selling supplies, you're doing what everyone else does. So Putin has a generation of officers who are militarily incompetent. They have traded away their supplies, their uniforms, the engines, their fuels. There is a great disconnect between officer and enlisted, and it, it's showing the capability of the Russian armed forces is extremely limited. I'll point to another example. Uh, south of Kherson, uh, Ukraine has been able to put approximately three or four hundred troops onto the south bank of, of the Dnieper. Ukraine recently uh, withdrew from a little village called Krinky. Those 400 guys fought a Russian airborne division, 20,000 people, they fought them to a frazzle. Let's put this this way. 
If it was the American 82nd Airborne Division, the Bastards of Bastogne, one of America's premier parachute organization, paratroopers, how long do you think it would take them to take a village with 30 houses in? Right? You, you have to hold Russia to the same standards that you would hold a NATO armed forces. It doesn't look good for them, Jason. And I'll go back to it. They don't have a plan. They don't have a plan. And that's not good to be in a war without a plan and ask America how Vietnam went because they didn't have a plan either. We appreciate your time as always. Thank you, Jason. Always good to talk to you. 